Hi everyone, today we are looking at the topic water and in this part of the lesson we will be looking at the physical properties of water. So we will look at things like surface tension and viscosity and what those terms really mean and why water has a high surface tension and why, what is the viscosity of water as well as what does the viscosity and um, surface tension of water allows it to do. So let's look at what surface tension is. So surface tension is the forces acting on the surface of the molecules. So the water molecules in the water act on the forces on, uh, provide uh, upward forces to the surface of the molecule and this creates an unbalance of force and that unbalance of force creates a surface tension. Now let's look at the surface tension of different types of liquid. So water has a, su a surface tension of 72.6 whereas ethanol has 22.3, methanol has 22.6, um, aston has 23.7, hexane has 18.4, and chloroform has 27.1. But from all of this, you can see that water has the high surface tension. So water has a very, very strong surface tension. And as a result, you will see in the following slides that what the water uh, due to this high surface tension allows insects to wa walk on it. So you can see insects walking on water as well as when you put a coin on water it floats and all, is due, all these are due to the unbalanced upward forces caused by the water molecules on the surface of the liquid. So from the table you can see that water has the high surface tension of any liquid in the list and also only mercury is the only liquid that has a higher surface tension than water. But we know that mercury is a very thick liquid, it's almost like a metal. So therefore, mercury has a higher surface tension than water, but we don't look at, but except mercury, all other liquids, if you can see in the table, we are presenting very different types of liquid. And all of these have a much, much lower surface tension than water, which has a very high surface tension of 72.6. Now, the effects of surface tension, as you can see, allows water to do many different things. So when you look at droplets of water, for example, you would see that droplets are usually a round shape. For example, on a leaf, after a rainfall, when you look at the leaf, you would see droplets of water on the leaf. And those leaves will have uh, circular shaped droplets, not like square shapes. They will always be circular shaped. And why is that the case? Because of surface tension. The surface tension holds the water molecules together in a circular shape. And that's why the droplets of water have a round shape. Surface tension also allows uh, insects to walk on water. So again, the insects do not sink to the bottom of, bottom of water due to the forces of the molecules pushing the surface of water upwards. And therefore, insects are able to uh, walk on water. Same with things floating on water. For example, razor blade. So if you take a glass of water and you put a razor blade in the glass of water, it will definitely not sink because razor blade has a lower density and also because of the fact that the water has a high surface tension. So the high surface tension holds the laser bed up and allows it to float across the surface of water. Now let's look, another, in a, let's look at another term, viscosity. So what does viscosity mean? Viscosity is the measure of, it, uh, of a liquid's resistance to flow or to be poured. So substances, for example, that are less viscous will flow very easily. So if you have a big empty beaker and you have a beaker of water, and you, if you try to pour the uh, water into the beaker, it will flow very easily because water is not that viscous compared to glycerol, where you can see in this table, glycerol has a viscosity of one uh, 1490. So if you try to pour glycerol, the flow rate will be much slower. So glycerol, glycerol will not flow as freely as water will because again, glycerol is quite more viscous than water itself. Now again, if you look, so water has a rather high viscosity compared to several liquids, but not as high as mercury or glycerol by comparing the rate of flow of liquids. So for example, in this picture, you can see that a less viscous liquid is flowing quite quickly compared 
uh, sorry, a less viscous liquid is flowing quite quickly compared to a more viscous liquid which is flowing really slowly. So there is, it's the same beaker, both has the same um, size of um, holes and everything. But again, because this one is much more viscous, it's flowing much more slowly compared to that one because again, the viscosity is low in this liquid. The higher the viscosity, the slower the rate of flow. So that's what is represented in the diagram. So if the viscosity is high, for example, in, uh, in this one, the rate of flow will be much more slower. Now let's look at the forces cohesion and addition. So first we will look at what these forces really mean. For example, cohesion is the force with which a substance sticks together. Also, the cohesion cohesive force is between the water molecules. So it, uh, the cohesive force um, remains between two of a like molecules. For example, in this picture you can see both of the molecules are the same represented by the same color and the same symbol. So both A and molecule and the force between these two molecules, the same molecules, is cohesive force. Now let's look at adhesive force. Now adhesive force uh, allows substance to stick to another substance. So this is the force between a water molecule and a glass molecule for example. So when you put a water in a glass, the glass gets wet. And why is that? Because of the adhesive force. Forces form between the water molecule and the glass molecule. So again, with adhesive force, the force is between two different substances. So this is represented by a triangular shape and a square shape. So the triangular shape is a different molecule represented by the letter B and here the water molecule is represented by the letter A. So you can see that adhesive force are between different molecules whereas cohesive force is between the same molecules in a substance. Now both of the forces result from intermolecular interactions. So the forces that exist between uh, two different uh, particles that attract them together is known as intermolecular attractions. So the forces, the cohesive and the adhesive forces are due to intermolecular interactions. Now water wets glass. Since the substance of glass contains many oxygen to which water can form hydrogen bond. Now hydrogen bond is an intermolecular, flow for, uh, intermolecular force between uh, hydrogen and our electronegative atoms such as oxygen or nitrogen. So water weights glass because there is an adhesive force between the water and the glass molecules and that adhesive force is due to intermolecular attraction and the intermolecular attraction that applies to glass and between glass and water is hydrogen bond. Now let's look at the first hand investigation. Uh, in this one we will look at how does salt affect the boiling point of water. So in this experiment your aim will be to investigate the effect of salt on the boiling point of water. Now you can also have a hypothesis included in your report and your hypothesis can be um, salt affects the boiling point of water or it can be that salt does not affect the boiling point of water and again when you're concluding your experiment you have to always refer back to your hypothesis and in the conclusion you will uh, always say that yes my hypothesis was correct salt does affect the boiling point of water or in the conclusion you can say my hypothesis was wrong salt does not affect the boiling point of water. So let's look at the method that we will follow to conduct this experiment. So first of all, we will use uh, this setup. So it will be a, a distillation uh, equipment with condenser. So we have to set up the apparatus as shown in the diagram. So you will use retort stands, you will use a condenser, you will use a distillation, um, distillation um, system. Also you will use a beaker. And uh, what is the next step? So in the next step, we have uh, two separate experiments. So in separate experiments, boil a sample of pure water and a sample of seawater. Now we would think that why do we need to boil a pure water when we are only testing the effect of salt on water? Well, if you only test seawater, the results you get, you, do, you can't compare it to something else. So you need a control in your experiment 
and in the control you are not changing your variables so in a sea water you're changing the variables because you're adding salt to it but in a pure water there is no salt added to it it's in its pure form it does not have anything added to it therefore if you boil a pure water you will find out what is the actual boiling point of water and then if you boil sea water which has salt added to it you can compare this two and see whether salt really does affect the uh, affect the uh, boiling point of water if it does then the boiling point should be higher or lower than the boiling point of pure water where nothing is added so tabulate the temperature measurements each minute as the samples boil. So again, you want to record the boiling point. So make sure every minute you, um, you take a um, record of the uh, temperature change. So you have to re um, know that whether the temperature is increasing every minute and does, uh, at what temperature does the water start boiling. So you have to record the temperature at every minute. So what are the typical results we will find when we conduct this experiment? So pure water boils at 100 degrees Celsius and stays at that temperature during the distillation. So when you're boiling pure water, so in this apparatus, when you're using pure water instead of salt water, at 100 degrees Celsius, your water should start boiling and it should remain at 100 degrees Celsius throughout the whole boiling process. But what happens when you're at seawater? So when you are testing seawater, which has salt dissolved to it, the temperatures get greater than 100. So therefore, the temperature will be around 102 or 103. So when you add salt to your water, your boiling point increases, to, uh, increases more than 100 degrees Celsius. So it increases to 102 or to uh, around 102 or 103 degrees Celsius. So and also, as the boiling continues, the boiling point rises as salt concentration increases in the flask. And why does salt concentration increase in the flask? Because when you're boiling water, some of the water is evaporating, so therefore it's, re re uh, it's escaping from the reaction vessel and it's going to the beaker. So therefore, but the salt is still remained in the beaker. And therefore, um, the, um, so salt is still in the beaker and therefore the concentration of salt increases because the amount of water is decreasing but the amount of salt still remains the same so the concentration of the salt increases over time and because the concentration of salt increases over time so does the boiling point the boiling point keep rises keep rising over the um, over the time because again the amount of salt increases. So with this first time in investigation, you can conclude that when you add salt to your water, it increases the boiling point of water. So again, if our hypothesis was, does salt affect the boiling point of water? So our hypothesis would be yes, salt does affect the boiling point of water. Because by conducting the experiment, we saw that if we add salt to water, it increases the boiling point. So the boiling point of water will be greater than 100 degrees Celsius. So it will be around 102 to 103 degrees Celsius. Now, when you conduct this experiment, you have to uh, um, take some precautions as with all other experiments. So again, Whenever you conduct an experiment, you need to um, assess your risks because every single experiment has some risk involved. First of all, all the apparatus you're using is made of glass. And glasses, as you know, can easily fall and break and can ca uh, cause cuts and other types of injuries. So again, when you're using glass materials, always make sure that you're handling them carefully handling them carefully because you don't want them to drop and break and cut yourself. And what are the other safety measures? So you always need to wear safety glasses whenever you conduct an experiment. Also with this experiment, you are using fire. So flame is involved and you do not want any flame or any additional heat to reach your eyes. And therefore always make sure that you are wearing your safety glasses while you conduct this experiment. Also ensure that cold water is flowing through the condenser at all times because again, you do not want an apparatus to get too hot because if it does, the glass might crack because um, if it's too hot, the glass can't have that much high heat capacity. So the glass might uh, crack if it gets too hot. Also, 
If it gets too hot and you touch the glass, you might burn yourself and you don't want that. So always make sure that the cold water is flowing through the condenser so the apparatus is kept as cool as possible. Now let's look at um, accuracy and reliability of this experiment. So how will you ensure that the results you get are accurate and also reliable? So first, always remember whenever you talk about reliability, you are talking about repeating the experiment. So when you conduct an experiment, the method should be, uh, be easily be repeatable by someone else. So when someone else looks at your method, he should be able to repeat your experiment. And also, by repeating the experiment, if you get the same results over and over, uh, then it ensures that the result, result you get is valid because you get the same results. And also, there is no impurities or any uh, thing uh, hampering your result. Also, you can improve your reliability by combining and averaging results from all class groups. So again, during your school time, you do not have enough um, during your class, uh, class time, you do not, do not have enough time to repeat an experiment five times, for example. But if you guys separate yourselves into five different groups and each of you are conducting the same experiment, that is the same as repeating the experiment five times. So if you guys all receive the same results, that means the experiment is valid and the method you're uh, using is valid as well because all of you are getting the same result. So that's similar to repeating an experiment. And also there will be slight variations in your results because equipments are not always accurate. And how do you get over uh, the fact that there is a little bit of variations? For example, point, there might be 0.1 or 0.2 variations in your result. And to overcome that, you always need to average your results. To overcome any variations or any disruptions, you always average your results to get a final value. Also to check validity of the experiment, you need to make sure that your thermometer is calibrated. And what does that mean? So you take a substance and you uh, make sure that you know that the uh, temperature of the substance. So you know the accurate temperature of the substance. And then when you put the thermometer in, if the thermometer gives the right temperature, that means your thermo thermometer is calibrated accurately. So therefore, when you measure the temperature of your boiling point, you are sure that the thermometer is giving the correct reading. So the reading of the thermometer is not uh, uh, anything different to what it should be. So that's why whenever you're conducting this experiment, you need to make sure that your, that your thermometer is calibrated. So if the temperature is not 100 degrees Celsius on boiling, determine the calibration factor, the cali uh, calibration factor, the calibration factor that needs to be applied to the thermometer. So what does that mean? For example, you know that, uh, you know that a substance has a boiling point of 105 degrees, for example. So that is the accurate boiling point of that substance, 105 degrees. But when you put a thermometer in that boiling state of the substance, the thermometer reads it as 110 degrees. So you know that the calibration factor is 5 degrees more than the actual uh, measurement that it should be. So when you're doing your experiment and you get 100 degrees Celsius, but your thermometer is reading higher, you know, already know that your calibration factor is 5 degrees Celsius. So your thermometer always reads 5 degrees above the actual reading that it should be. So if you use that calibration factor, you will get an accur uh, accurate result. Again, to improve the accuracy of the experiment, you can use a mercury thermometer than an alcohol thermometer because mercury is gen generally much more accurate in measuring temper uh, temperatures than alcohol and also heat the flask gently and slowly and also make sure that you're placing the Bunsen burner on the middle of the apparatus and not on one side because if you put it on one side only that part would be heated and if your thermometer is at the center then it's the um, temperature of the whole apparatus is not uniform because only one side of the apparatus is heated. So always make sure that your Bunsen burner is at the center of the apparatus so that the whole mixture gets uniformly heated. And again, uh, always make sure that the flask is heated gently and slowly because again, you don't want to damage any of the apparatus 
and also those apparatus will be made out of glass so you don't want to crack the glasses and um, spill all the liquid so make sure that the flask is heated gently and slowly and ensure that the thermometer bulb is at the surface of the liquid and not at the top and why is that the case because we know that liquids had a, have a tendency to follow convection. And what is convection? Convection is hot liquid it rises to the top and then cold liquid rises to the bottom. So the liquid in um, uh, a liquid in a um, beaker will always be circulating. And you do not want any uh, disruptions due to that convection factor. And hence, you want to place a thermometer bulb at the surface of the liquid so you can get the accurate measure of the heat. That is the boiling point. Now this brings us to the end of the theory session. Let's look at some questions to test your knowledge. So question 11 tells you to recall the meaning of the term surface tension. So here you only need to recall. That means that you only need to remember what surface tension means. And what does it mean? Surface tension is the forces acting on the surface of a liquid. So in liquid water, you have a lot of water molecules. So all these water molecules exert an upward force to the surface of the liquid, which causes the liquid to have a surface tension. Now let's move on to question 12. Question 12 asks you to explain what causes surface tension in a liquid. Now again, notice that the verb is explained. So you have to relate cause and effect. So the effect is that liquid has a surface tension. But what causes that surface tension? Why does liquid have a surface tension? That's what you have to mention in this question. So a surface tension of liquid is caused by an unbalanced downward force between the molecules. So because the molecules are providing an upward force towards the surface of a liquid, there is an unbalanced downward force because there is a greater upward force on the surface. And due to that unbalanced downward force, all liquids have a surface tension. Let, now let's move on to question 13. Question 13 again asks you to explain what determines the viscosity of liquid. So again, you can see that the verb is explained. So that means you have to relate the cause and the effect. So effect is, there is viscosity of liquid, so that's the effect. But what causes that effect? Why does li uh, liquids have viscosity? What forces causes liquids to have viscosity? So you have to explain that. So forces of attraction between molecules of liquid causes the viscosity in liquid. So uh, uh, again, in a water molecule, in a water uh, solution, you will have a lot of water molecules, and there will be forces of attraction between the lot of molecules. Now, if the forces of attraction are strong between the water molecules, then your viscosity will be high. But if your forces of attraction is weak between the liquid molecules, then your forces of uh, then your viscosity will be low. So again, the stronger the force between the molecules, the greater the viscosity. And if the uh, forces are weaker, the viscosity is also weaker. And what does that mean? If you have a weaker viscosity, the liquid will flow very easily compared to a more viscous liquid, which will flow much more slowly. Now let's look at uh, question 14. Question 14 tells you to ask you what does the term coercion mean? Again, you only need to provide a definition for the term coercion. You do not need to explain why coercion forces exist. So let's look at what the definition for coercion is. So coercion is the force with which a substance sticks together. So coercion allows water molecules to stick to each other. And again, also remember the fact that Coercive forces always exist between like molecules. So both of the molecules have to be same for a coercive force to exist between them. Again, a coercive force helps the substance to stick to each other. Now let's look at question 15, which is our last question. So question 15 asks you, how does salt alter the freezing point of water? Now if you remember your first hand investigation, when we added the salt to our water, the boiling point did not stay the same. The boiling point increased. So the boiling point increased from 100 degrees Celsius 
to 102 or 100 deg uh, 103 degrees Celsius. So what does salt do to the freezing point of water? Salt lowers the freezing point of water. So when you add salt to water, what happens is water will freeze at a much lower temperature. So water won't freeze at 0 degrees Celsius anymore. It will freeze at a much, much lower temperature. Now this brings us to the end of the um, uh, to the end of this lesson and in this topic we looked at surface tension and viscosity and what those terms mean and how are they caused and also we uh, looked at the surface tension and viscosity of water. Mm -hmm.